everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Technically Speaking. My guest today is Keith Rich, Principal Designer at Think Company, coming to us live from Philly. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Thank you. A pleasure to be here and uh, glad you uh, invited me to speak today. Yeah. Look, we're we're like, you know, summer's kicking off. What's the vibe in Philly right now? Yeah. I mean, a lot of, you know, just coming off of, uh, you know, the, the Memorial Day weekend, pretty good. The weather's, you know, ever changing, as we say right now. So, yeah, looking forward to 4th of July, Juneteenth, Father's Day's coming up. There's, you know, yeah. more holidays to come. Yeah. That's a busy little back-to-back thing. Is there, yeah. is there anything special about, like, you know, Philly this time of the year that you just absolutely love? It's uh, a great question. I mean, it's funny. We're so close to Jersey and, and Ocean City and the beaches. So, you know, a lot of times we take that trip over and go to the beach a little bit. So I was just actually in Lewis, Delaware, because it's only two hour drive away. So wow. also then I'm going to New York this weekend. So that's another two hours. So the fact that we're like here, able to bounce around, but also still enjoy the stuff that's in Philly as well. Yeah. 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 That That's not, I kind of miss that about just living. I mean, I grew up in the Midwest, but even on the yeah. East coast, just being able to hop in a car and get somewhere totally different is nice. I mean, it, it takes a little bit longer in California and on the West coast. But, I've, I've but been in that traffic. <laughs> oh yeah, that traffic. <laughs> exactly. Hey, so one of the things I, I wanted to start the show off with was a few icebreakers and, you know, I'll, I'll keep them as easy and light as possible, but feel free to expand on them if you sure. will. So cool. I'm going to give you like the the stereotypical, you know, icebreaker here. Are you like team hoagie or team cheesesteak? Is there like a one versus the other? Like it's not really a contest. It's cheesesteak all the way. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was, that was easy. <laughs> There was no hesitation for folks right. listening. No yeah. hesitation. I think when I said hoagie, you already had cheesesteak coming out of your mouth. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, so what is something that you are currently obsessed with? I got to say, it's just probably design system platforms. So mm. I sit in kind of in between the space of design and development. So anything that I can build design using real code with. Uh, and mm-hmm. one example of it is Interplay. That, that's great at like pulling in React code and kind of being able to design with that. So that's where I'm like, all my attention is kind of focused on that right now. How do we get that closer together? Yeah. Is this is this from like a, like a documentation perspective? Maybe kind of dive into that a little bit more. Yeah, it's a, it definitely, I mean, documentation, getting on the same page, uh, whether you're a designer, developer, content strategist, you know, product owner, anything. Uh, but really it gets down to like using the actual components. So mm-hmm. of course, when you're in Figma and Sketch and a lot of the design programs, you're almost building the replica. You're not really building the exact thing right. until you get to code. And it's like, oh yeah, people are using that thing. Mm. Uh, so when we can get to the point of designing with the thing that people will eventually use, that's like you know efficiency and everything is saved. Uh, but also you're speaking the same language from the start there. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a whole lot of sense. I, I think one of the challenges that I have is you know, we're kind of going through a bit of a, a code base change. Actually, our code base is pretty far behind, but our yeah. design systems team is way ahead. Mm-hmm. And so for us being in sort of this transitionary period, you know, their expectations that the code is there and now that's where the conflict happens, right? right. And so obviously this isn't anything unique to any development team, but I think to get to where you're at, I think is sort of the true form of enlightenment when it comes to designs or at least the holy grail when it comes to design yeah. system. It feels very zen like, yeah, when you're in that space yeah. of like, oh yeah, there's no need to, to translate. Like we're all on the same page. All right, let's go. <laughs> let's let's yeah. now think about bigger problems beyond the UI. Yeah. It must be gratifying to kind of finally get to that point, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I, w- I, I have to look back and realize like, oh yeah, how long have I been in this industry? So uh, yeah, it's like been 10 years now, uh, which yeah. I'm like still kind of blows my mind that it's it's been that long. Uh, but yeah. I was in advertising before for about six years uh, and then switched over to, to UX and product design about five years ago now. So yeah, wow. it was a good, good switch. Yeah. So for listeners that haven't like done their research, you're really into soccer. And I have a couple questions here. This is a multi-pronged <laughs> question. How did you get into soccer? And then what's your favorite team or as they call in Europe, your favorite club? Yeah. Awesome. Great questions because it started pretty early for me. I don't know that I had a choice, but, you know, my parents were putting me in the, the leagues when I was three or four years old. So that's where at least, you know, the very early memories of it started. I definitely faded out because I, I grew up in Baltimore and so soccer wasn't popular at all. It was basketball, football, baseball. Yeah. Those were the things you kind of got into. And then, you know, fast forward 
probably like 12 years later, Freddie Adu joined the MLS, the youngest player to ever join a yeah. professional uh, league in the world. Yeah. And so, you know, seeing a kid that was 14 play with grownups and professionals, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> so I, I got back into soccer right around that time. And uh, yeah, my favorite team is, is Arsenal over in London, basically because Thierry Henry at the time was just you know, yeah. the best player and, and really just had that confidence and, and the style about his game that was like, yeah, I want to I want to play like that. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get a chance to see Thierry Henry when he was playing in the MLS? Uh, yeah. So I, pl- I went to the Red Bulls game. It was, I think it was Arsenal versus Red Bulls. Oh, and I'm wow. sure he, I'm sure he set that up because, you know, being in both the clubs. So yeah, I actually had a chance to, to watch them and it was, it was fascinating. Nice. Yeah. I've, I've gotten into soccer recently, so I, I have season tickets to the San Jose earthquakes, Ooh. but they are awful. <laughs> <laughs> they got a nice but, stadium though the stadium is like real that whole like end of the sta- stadium is all a bar it's like the longest bar. yes ever. it's the longest yeah it's the longest bar i i will say this like you know they're going through a tough time right now but i think one of the things i appreciate is just kind of how community based the the organization is so you know like being able to meet the players, being able to walk on the pitch has been really cool and a lot more affordable than anything right, that's right. basketball or football oriented out here. So definitely. Yeah, they had the all star game there, I think, you know, maybe it was two years ago. Is that two, three back? years ago? Yeah. 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 I was like, I think it was the last all star game where they would bring in sort of like the B list all stars from Europe. <laughs> right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And then but COVID it, happened and yeah, everything changed exactly. after that. Exactly. But it's it's great to see the excitement growing in, in the MLS for sure. Oh, so, yeah. okay. One last icebreaker. Yeah. Okay. This is a little silly, <laughs> but you know how they have like those entrance songs when you walk into the stadium, like if you're a wrestler or a ba- baseball player, yep. what would your song be? Jeez. This is a tough one, actually. All the oh. music I'm listening to right now is not really pump up. It's like the chill vibe right now. So ah. uh, I would have to say child, uh, uh, band from Canada is Three Eyes Child. Uh, okay, but yeah, I think I'm just coming real smooth and and mellow as opposed to. Well, you, but you got to describe. You got to describe this, yeah. right? People are listening. So, how would you describe <laughs> the music from Child? Well, I, they would uh, describe it as synthetic soul. So it's it mm. really hits you right there, and it, it is like nostalgia in audio form. Hmm nostalgia though but that's that's relative so sure, what nostalgia sure. does that strike for you yeah for for me it's just the the carefreeness so being able to mm. come out there whatever you're doing enjoying it in the moment and not really mm. too worried about uh anything else other than being in the zone yeah i love that we need that right now for sure so thank you thank you for sharing so we'll wrap it up on the icebreakers appreciate you articulating all of that and we yeah. get a, a little bit into what keith enjoys outside of design and in design but let's maybe kind of start here tell us about keith rich who is keith rich how did you get into design and what were some of your influences yeah yeah so we talked about it a little bit before but the first thing if you sell my name is probably gonna be soccer coming right after that uh, it really is like the thing that consumes my life the most uh, whether it's watching playing yeah but mostly just being a fan and lover of the sport that's universal wherever you go someone has played soccer or knows what soccer is and there's different ways to you know explain it that way but yeah then when that merges with design and my creativity i think that's where those two worlds collide of, of the creativity on the field but also being able to you know come up with solutions for people to to use and enjoy through their day yeah so how did you how did you get into design that's a great question so it actually still revolves around soccer uh ah. there's a old school forum i don't know if you remember those days where there were forums and people yeah. would post uh, but yeah, it was called soccer art. And mm. we had one computer growing up in my parents' room. I would take all day long using Photoshop Express <laughs> and uh, putting together wallpapers, doing video editing, and mm. really just like going to town on that stuff. So it was all about like the art of connecting soccer to art. And that's how I got started. Yeah. I have a very fond memory mm-hmm. of playing, I think it was FIFA 99 on Ooh. Windows. <laughs> And like, I don't think I've necessarily shared this on the show, but one of the earliest kind of ways that I I started designing was by cracking games and editing like different meshes and textures in it. And so, you know, in the early days, you know, there wasn't any real like player likeness. There wasn't really any sort of like kit designs. And so a lot of boxes, boxes, a lot of boxes. The fists were like (laughs) boxes. Right. And I remember just downloading this one sort of like it was like a kit package and it created like basically all of the Premier League jerseys 
back then. And I, I don't know, Jeez. like for me, that was, that was really awesome, but it took a lot of like programming, but Photoshop was a kind of a key element to that. You know, a lot of it was through system prompts. I, I forget exactly oh, yeah. how to wow. do it. Like you would have to actually <laughs> like unpackage like the files. Jeez. So, but I mean, that didn't matter back then. Cause I was like pirating the games, you know? So, right. you know, I could always just re-download the package. It would just take two days. Right. But yeah, I, I, I kind of miss some of the, like there's some nostalgia tied to that too. Right. Definitely. There's so, a soundtrack so, for it. I was going to say, there's it? a soundtrack for every FIFA game. Oh. And so if you hear a song, you're like, oh, that was FIFA 2001. Or, oh you know, <laughs> you know who was on yeah. the cover of the game? All that yeah. stuff. Yeah. I remember that that game. I think it had like like Rockefeller Skank was the theme song of that one. I think, <laughs> and so every time I hear it, I'm like, oh yeah. my gosh, like throwback. Yeah. yeah, we could we could nerd out on FIFA specifically for a long time because sure. there's a lot of memories attached to it throughout my life. But yeah, so so how did that sort of evolve into kind of moving into you know some of the the agency work and, and sort of where you're at today? Yeah. Uh, so speaking about being nerdy, there was a web page club. In my high school, I don't know how many high schools have web page clubs. But oh wow! <laughs> yeah, I, my first website was designing my high school's website, eight hundred mm. by six hundred pixels. Oh, uh, that was high res yeah. back then. Right, right. And so yeah. from there, it was like, oh, I don't, I can't only make art that people are just going to look at. I can make work, you know, art that people are going to use and, mm. and you know, wayfind around the web. So, so that was my first real introduction to interaction design or UX design, however you would have wanted to call it back then. Yeah. But yeah, that was that was definitely the first time I was like, this this could turn into something different, you know, agency of work or you know, being at a yeah, company. yeah. Did you know that like that agency work or what, that there was a, even a career in design or designing web pages at that point? At the time, I don't think I did because it, yeah, it was definitely more. I was coming at it from the angle of artistic, you know, expression. Yeah. So it was all about like me mm. just putting stuff out there and seeing how people reacted but yeah right after school you know they were talking about internships and you know getting yeah. jobs and i was like okay then i had that realization i was like am i an artist or am i a designer <laughs> or both yeah. so i think i leaned into that design and like this is all about communicating visually uh to people yeah. and that's all about you know how they interact and, and kind of perceive it versus how i would put it out there yeah yeah, that's like, that's such a, I feel like that's a conundrum for a lot of folks that started an art. So I remember in college specifically, college was really interesting because I feel like I just never fit into the situations that I was in because so I played football for a couple of years. Yeah. And so as I was playing football, I was also getting into my studio art classes. And what happens is that, you know, you have to go to these things called study tables. And so study tables is where, you know, you have your classes in the morning, you might have your tutors and you practice for most of the afternoon, you eat dinner, and then you have to mandatory clock in around like 10, 12 hours a week with all the other athletes. <laughs> So most people are kind of like working on their papers or their exercises and then I'm right. walking in with like <laughs> huge pieces of paper and then I'm drawing, yeah. right? Yeah. So I still remember like people like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the flip side of that is like when I was in my studio art class, it's more specifically for like design or mixed media. Right. I had a very like digital mindset, right? Like thinking about columns and typography and hierarchy. And so like there was this interesting moment where I was like, Harrison, you're thinking about this too much. Your ideas are way too structured. You've got to let them flow. And I'm like, what, where am I right now? Like, did I choose the right path? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think that's really, really interesting. Was there kind of a moment where it struck you of like, yeah, maybe this design thing is kind of the way to go? Because I think emotionally, yeah, you might be tied to the sort of the freedom of expression around art, but you're a little bit more constrained specifically if you start thinking about, you know, doing client work, right? Yeah. Because there are requests, you got deadlines, and it may not necessarily end up the way that you envisioned it. Totally. Yeah. I think it was when I got a D plus on some of my my artwork and so uh, you know i was on the cusp of like you had to make a choice after i think it was freshman year whether you're going yeah. into fine arts or where you were going to visual communications hmm. and at that point i was like at first i don't think i'm cut out for <laughs> art art in the the fine art way of thinking of it yeah but also yeah i just like definitely leaned into the the structure and trying to find that creativity within structure which is a difficult thing to do yeah 
Yeah. So one of the things that I loved, and I, I saw this on either your LinkedIn or your website, but you talk about your curiosity about the evolution of design. And I feel like some of the story kind of lends itself to that. Like, how would you define that? Like, what has that evolution been to you, if you could describe it? Yeah, for me, it's just not getting really complacent or thinking that whatever's happening today is going to be the same thing in three or four months. So almost like building in expiration dates to software or anything that's out there and realizing like you can't really put all the eggs in one basket because tech just moves way too fast. Uh, and mm. so, yeah, I'm always kind of looking at what that next thing is and ways to build efficiencies or, or just get to work that is like usually hard to think about and not reinvent the yeah. wheel, just kind of getting that stuff out of the way, the basics to move on to a bigger problem. Yeah. Was there any sort of specific moment in which like that really clicked for you? Let's see. As far as like the be, being curious and kind of like not being... I think the, the evolution piece, right? You know, there's a time component to it. And so, you know, that may not necessarily lend itself from, you know, the, the work that you were doing from a pure arts perspective. So yeah, at what point did that sort of say, okay, look at this evolution or maybe things do need to change. Maybe we do need to reapproach. Like when did you start to get that sort of mindset? That's a great question. And I think it is probably, I want to say Twitter. And that's a, <laughs> an interesting... Mm way to put it but it opened up the world to like what other people were doing whereas mm -hmm. a lot of times in agencies you're kind of stuck into ways of working within that company or that culture and so mm -hmm. when you're looking at people and who you know they're designing on different levels of you know whether they're product work or in companies or the agencies it's like they have a different approach and mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they found a way to be efficient in that setting so you know yeah. they kind of take some cues from from here and there and wonder oh they're using oh, yeah. a different program they're not just like thinking about it differently they're you know using different technology to get to the end goal there. Hmm. That's really fascinating. Did you feel that at the time, like I'm going to go back into your mindset yeah, back yeah, then, right? Did yeah. you feel at the time that you felt roadblock? Like, did you feel that you had a block in terms of creativity because you weren't seeing people do certain things? I think it's it's really, it's, it's interesting, right? I think like there can definitely be a vacuum of thinking within an organization, right? Or at least directly with the peers that you're working with. And so was that something that you were kind of going through at the time? Definitely. Yeah. I think when you feel that tension when you're working that like yeah. there has to be a better way <laughs> that's when i'm mm -hmm. like all right i need to go out there and see what that better way is and what people are you know other ways that people are thinking about that problem so yeah i think you kind of notice it right away when you're going through your days and you're like this feels like it should be easier we're in 2022 yeah. like you know why are we still you know doing it in a certain way uh, and really just right. challenging the status quo on on design and, and how the process kind of rolls out yeah yeah i love that i mean, think another thing and this is a great transition i think another thing too is there's different ways of thinking but also there are other people thinking sort of about the same ways that things that you are, but perhaps in different ways. And it's like a funny story kind of where this is kind of going is I remember I wrote this article on something called object oriented design. And the idea is that basically when you're starting to look at your system and, you know, different data objects, if you will, there's certain there's certain sort of aspects of them, right? And you can really relate this to object oriented programming, which is sort of like my entry point into it because I did a lot of programming when I was younger. And so it's really funny. I wrote this, I actually wrote this up probably like six, seven years ago. And I just felt that I didn't know what I was doing because no one else was talking about it. I or, see, yeah, yeah. you know, I don't know if you've ever been in like a situation where you're like, I don't know if like these esteemed design people are gonna, you know, think I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> And so I finally posted it like maybe a year ago. And then I saw that like there's like this whole training on object oriented UX. And then obviously that's something that you've been thinking about as well. So I'd love to kind of talk a little bit about, you know, we've, we've obviously kind of talked to the fact that you've been thinking about design systems, platform, but I'd love to maybe kind of dive into that a little bit more with you because I just find it very fascinating. And I think when we start thinking about even just, you know, consumer to enterprise work, these are things that really help the user comprehend different things. And and can really be helpful for designers. So what exactly is object oriented kind of UX and how has that played a role in, in the things that you're doing on a day to day? Yeah, definitely. I, I've got introduced to it way back when I was in advertising agency. A friend of mine sent me an article from Sophia Prater uh, and yeah. she mentioned like, you know, this is how I thought about basically breaking down all the different pieces and parts of, of the experience that you know she was about to build. And so at the time I was in advertising, so we weren't really building complex applications. Mm. And so it wasn't as relevant to me then. But then I went to over to Think Company and definitely been working on a little bit bigger projects and things that have more complexity as far as 
how things are related to each other. And OOUX fits right in where it's at the research level, very basic. So you're like, how is someone going to think about entering your, your platform or your, your application? And so if you're able to say, oh, these are the core objects, and then work your way down, you're almost visualizing the UI before you've even put, uh, you know, right. into paper or, you know, and done anything in a, in a uh, design program. Yeah. What are some examples? Can you give me maybe an example of, of how this might be put into practice? Also, shout out to Sophia Prater. Yeah. I was on her podcast, I think, last year, maybe oh, late last year. year. Time is in a warp <laughs> right now. I don't know. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You, you see a lot of post-it notes. So that's definitely, I think, Sophia's logo. You got the four boxes and, you know, categorizing objects, you know, nested objects, also the attributes of them. And then yeah. eventually, how is someone going to act on any of those objects? So really, it's, it's getting in a room. But again, that's harder now in this remote setting. And a lot of people are doing it in Figma or Miro, basically mm. translating what was done on whiteboards into the digital space. So I think it's it's easy to do with clients because they can kind of see it happening in the moment. Yeah. And a lot of times they're, if you're trying to explain it to them, they don't get it. But then when right. you're doing it, they're like, oh yeah, these are the things that make up the thing that you know I'm paying people to, to create. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, there's something always to just being able to to visualize things versus describing it. Yes. Or even just going hyper into like some very complex systems mapping. Mm -hmm. uh, you start noticing things are in groups and people really kind of resonate to these different types of groups. And then when you add that to hierarchy, I mean, it all starts to, to make sense. This is obviously one of the things that you do. So, you know, you're a principal designer and what is that? Like, I, I just love to understand what is a, a principal designer? How does that play a role? And what are the things that you do on the day to day? And, and maybe what are your aspirations, you know, being in a role like this or beyond? It's a great question. We are definitely in the stage where we're like defining what that is to cope. When I joined the company, there was no concept of principal designers. This is definitely something we're kind of seeing in the industry and kind of aligning ourselves to. But it's basically the next step after a senior individual contributor. So there's a path of going in design lead up to management or there's, you know, principals are kind of more focused on the craft, still leading projects, but maybe more so from a standpoint of being closer to the work. Whereas, you know, as a manager or as a leader, you're going to be more so looking at work from the highest level and not necessarily in, sure. the, in the weeds. So yeah. at, a, at a basic level, that's what uh, principal design is. Yeah. Is that a conscious decision you make to stay on that path versus management? <laughs> hey, so there's a, a talk from a guy, Russ Smashmeyer, and he okay. explained it so well. I think that was the point where I decided for myself. And he mentioned where you feel energized at the end of the day. So um, whatever you're doing, whether that's managing people, developing UIs, and being close to prototypes, if at the end of the day, you're like, oh man, that was that was a rough day. Like, I don't want to ever do that again. Uh, yeah. That kind of directs you towards where you want to go. So I, I find joy in prototyping and, and being in the in the weeds. And so that's what gives me energy. And I, I definitely want to you know stay in that direction. Yeah. Are there any sort of like key skill differentiators between sort of that senior role and a principal that, you know, have played an important part of, of your sort of success? Yeah, it's definitely like, I think you have some of like the trust of the company to be able to kind mm. of direct the path, whether that's through frameworks or really just on projects in particular, yeah. kind of crafting that, whether it's the design system language, finding your niche on that project. So for me, it is just definitely like bridging the gap between design and development and, and design systems. So as a principal design, or focused on visual, that's where I like find my focus area, whether it's on a project, but also growing that expertise at the company level. Yeah. Yeah. I want to get back to the design systems work that you're doing because you're, yeah. you're working really closely with developers. Oh yeah. What, what does that relationship look like? Because I think a lot of times sort of we talk about kind of like the execution. I don't think we talk a lot about sort of like the output and the partnership that that requires. If you could maybe kind of talk us through how you started to develop that relationship <laughs> and sort of like, where have you provided the value and where have engineers provided you value in this process as you're kind of working through it? Yeah, definitely. I, I think for me, because I had a little bit of knowledge and have been able to like code some websites myself, I think that lends all the credence to you trying to understand the language of development and then vice versa. Can developers yeah. understand the language of design? And so there's definitely many ways to go about that. But I think the, the main thing is just having a basic understanding of, of how each of those uh, disciplines work. And then yeah. from there, it's just really showing the work as, as often and as early as you can. A lot of times, I think as designers, we get like stuck in the idea that it's got to be perfect before we share it. Uh, and mm. so 
when you're opening that up, Figma does a great job of this. Anyone can come in, as long as you give them the link, of course, and see what you're working on at any time. And there's no more restrictions of like, all right, I got to wait for the designer to, to give me yeah. this before I know what I'm doing. The earlier, the better for everyone to kind of see what each other's doing, I think. Yeah, I love that. I love that. So look, we're getting to the, the top of the show. All right. <laughs> I know. I know. This is great. How about this? Like, is there any sort of advice that you would leave for the listeners? I want to say just like expand. <laughs> it's hard to say this, but like I, I feel for so long early in my career, I was very naive. And I mean, we still have all like degrees of naivete in us, but I think now I'm realizing how naive I am. So I can be able to kind of like adjust to that. If you think about Dave Thomas was on your show, I think uh, last year mm -hmm. and his all, you know, he's all about talking about bias as far as like how that informs the decisions that we make, but also how we design too. So the fact that you can understand that there's millions of biases out there that are impacting what you do every day, that's yeah. definitely somewhere to, to focus on and say like, okay, I made this decision, but was it based on, you know, research or, or based on something that I was feeling like this is the right solution. So uh, yeah. kind of detaching yourself from the work a little bit and really realizing like, oh yeah, I'm creating this, but it's not, it's not me. Like at the end of the day, no one knows I created it. Yeah. You just kind of put it out into the world. Hmm. I love that. I love that. How can folks follow you, get in touch with you? Where is Keith at on the internet? Yeah, mainly on Twitter. I, I've uh, purged Instagram and Facebook at this point. I watched the, the documentary Social Dilemma and hmm. I was like, man, that is some intense reporting there. So mostly on Twitter, Keith underscore Rich. Yeah, that's, that's the main place. Tweeting about soccer. Soccer, <laughs> mostly soccer. So if you don't like it, don't follow me. <laughs> Awesome. Well, hey, Keith, thank you so much for coming on the show and, you know, looking forward to, to seeing your progress on all the amazing work that you're doing. And I'm sure, you know, we'll, we'll have some further conversations about soccer in the future. Definitely. Definitely. Thanks, Harrison. I, yeah, I appreciate it. And uh, again, sad that it's all, it, it got cut short, but uh, yeah, we could talk for hours. Awesome. Thanks, man. Yep. Yeah.